five, four, three, two, one, zero. Begun in 1948 and carried out through the end of 1961, the Department of Defense and Department of Energy designed endless tests to subject ships, buildings, equipment, material, even soldiers and airmen to the direct effects of nuclear explosions. Those involved in these tests would become more than just human guinea pigs. Indeed, they would become the guinea pigs of the atomic era. just on an open hillside facing ground zero and just before the shot was dropped from an airplane they told us to turn around and put your hands behind your head put your knees up you know and put your head between your knees and that we did and you could you could just feel like a blowtorch going across the back of your neck when the blast went off we got out of our trenches and foxholes and had a simulated attack on ground zero. When I got out of my foxhole, the sandbags were burning and the uh, sand was spun to glass like, like ice. No, I didn't have any worries whatsoever. When you're 22, uh, heck, you, you think you're, <laughs> so I didn't, didn't think a thing about it till it got to five. And then I start, like I said, crouching down. Most people talk about it, it's just something that happened. And unless you talk to some of the other fellas that's been on through a shot or something like that that really knows what's happened. Uh, I don't think the outside world realizes what it really is. Minus two minutes. Everyone kneel down in your foxholes, look down, and stay down. I was drafted into the Army in 1951, January of 1951, and I went down to the Nevada desert in uh, October of 1951 to participate in the uh, 
Buster Jangle series of uh, nuclear tests. Up until that time, nuclear weapons had been delivered uh, with airplanes, and the war in Korea was going on, and so they had anticipated use, the use of uh, smaller nuclear weapons, or, that is, tactical nuclear weapons, ones that could be delivered by uh, artillery shell, for example. And they wanted to know whether uh, soldiers would be able to continue uh, fighting under under that kind of situation. They had a whole scenario written down, you know, the Russians had invaded and come ashore in, in uh, either Northern California, Oregon, or Washington and were, were driving south and, and east and, uh, you know, it was just all of their, the games that the Pentagon plays, or that they love to play. I was a mechanic and driver in A Company of the 231st Combat Engineer Battalion, which was the uh, organization responsible for building the animal pens and, and retrieving the, uh, the demolished and the destroyed equipment at the test site and preparing the test site for the various tests. The, the men were brought up from, from uh, Camp Desert Rock, put in the trenches, and told to turn around. And when the bomb went off, they were told to, to turn back around to, to watch, to, to observe the mushroom cloud as it, uh, as it went up into the air. And then they were brought out of the trenches and marched towards Ground Zero. We were stationed where we could hear the countdown, and so we'd fall out early in the morning and the sun would be coming up, and we'd be waiting to see if we could see the airplane and, or to hear the airplane as it, as it came over to, uh, to see if we could see this thing while it, while it was falling. And we were told to turn our backs because we didn't uh, have glasses or any protective eye gear, and uh, the, the countdown would begin and then uh, when the explosion went off, the, the entire desert lit up like uh, a, a brighter than daylight. And the, everything stood out in, in uh, bright relief, you know, the, the yucca plants and the, and the sagebrush and, and those kinds of things were just so vivid. And it was, if, if you've been to the test site and you know where Yucca Flat is, it's kind of a large basin. And this whole basin just lit up with, uh, with light. It was. Uh, an awe-inspiring uh, event. When I left the test site, I knew that as human beings, we had the ability to destroy ourselves. And I've been thinking about that ever since 1951. And, uh, you know, if, and if saner heads uh, don't prevail, we're gonna do it, seems to me. One of the most troubling series of tests were the Tumbler Snapper troop tests. The idea was essentially sound, that there was less to fear from a nuclear bomb than commonly believed. With a proper shelter and the right distance from the blast, soldiers would survive the blast unharmed. But how do you convince the forces? The military answer was to dig trenches, bring in the troops, and drop bombs. It was a period of remarkable naivety. I didn't volunteer 
to go out and be a guinea pig. Originally, they said, they, they picked out some in each company that was there. They said, well, you, you're due for orientation March 16th at 2 o'clock. You're going to witness atomic explosion. They made me sign a paper. I guess it was some kind of release, but if I, you know, they couldn't make you go, but if you didn't go, you could be court-martialed. So I signed it and went. We went to what they had, the canteen tent, and there was a captain and colonel giving us a rundown a little bit what was going to happen. He said, in no way would we put you in harm's way. He said, so they asked, you know, how much radiation we're going to get. He said, oh, it'd be a, probably a little less than a regular chest x-ray. I mean, everybody looked around and kind of, you know, snickered. We knew better than that. But anyway, that, that morning of the 17th, we got in buses and trucks. It was, it was still dark. This was about 4 o'clock in the morning, and we went about 25 miles to the forward area. And I think the blast was detonated at 5.20, and it was still dark. It was, it was an open shot, and we were 2,500 yards from ground zero in a foxhole with, with no protective gear whatsoever. They told us to crouch down and keep our eyes closed and put our hands over our eyes. But when the blast went off, it was, you know, brighter than day. And I peeked a little bit, and I could see the bones in my hand. And then the shock wave went over us, and then it hit off of a mountain, and the back blast was worse than the, the original shock wave. But then the helicopters went over, and we started a simulated attack on ground zero and halfway there my feet were getting hot and I looked down at my combat boots and the half soles were you know curled up starting to peel off it was it, you know it was that hot They built uh, two brick houses, and they had new cars set around at different intervals. They had sheep and pigs and, and cattle. And we got within probably 200 yards from the crater of the initial blast. This was a tower shot. And I looked over, and I couldn't see anything left of those houses. I looked around, and there was some sheep but their wool was on fire and there was some pigs running around squealing and I could see over on my right a pig just fell over dead. They had planted trees and had cars and they had mannequins, you know, sitting in the windows and, but there was nothing left. Then we, we, we marched back to buses and trucks to go back to camp. They did have a, gu a guider counter. All they did was dust us off and run the guider counter over. I, I had a film badge that, that time and a film badge the second time, but eight times in the forward area, I didn't have a film badge. My job was, I was on a detail to take tanks and equipment out and put them in designated spots for a shot. Then after the shot, we would go out and drag them back to Camp Mercury for the scientists to evaluate, you know, how much damage and at what interval and, and, ha and how much radiation there, there was. But like I said, we didn't have any protective equipment. All we had was 
what a combat infantryman would have in the field. You know, fatigues, a steel pot, an M1 rifle, and the, and the combat boots. And that was all we had. Walter Cronkite was there to that shot. And I'd seen him on TV not too long ago describing this shot. But anyway, they were eight miles, what they call Knob Hill, because that's where all the newsmen was, eight miles back. And they had big goggles on. We don't have nothing, not a thing. Well, I've had lung problems, I've had bleeding stomach, arthritis, um, gallbladder trouble, urinary tract trouble. I've had heart problems and heart attacks. But right after that blast when I was a guinea pig, the next day I had bleeding gums. And I lost two weeks after that, my teeth started getting loose. In fact, I reached in there and, and just one just fell out. And I lost seven teeth and I had terrific um, stomach problems and then I started hemorrhaging. I had to have stomach surgery. They, they said it was, was ulcers, but I know I didn't have any trouble before. They were bringing these ships from all around, the, all around, you know, into, put in the lagoon down there at Bikini to test the, the Abel and Baker on. The original three was a test bomb down on White Sands, and then Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, and the four and five were the two Bikini, bikini bombs. The Nevada was the target ship, and Nevada laid in the center of the target ships. We laid over on the port quarter. Abel exploded, oh, oh I, I don't know, 150 yards, something like that, from the Sakawa, not over the battleship, the target ship. It drove that thing together like an accordion. The guys that were in there told me and, and watched it sink. It took about 25 hours to sink it. I can't remember how many hours after that, then we went back into the lagoon and uh, proceeded to do what a seagoing tug does, you know. We hauled contaminated stuff out to, I, I believe, the 40,000 fathom mark and dropped it. This is a seagoing tug now, the ATA. 124, and we we done that up until it come time for Baker. Then when when they got all set up for Baker, then we went out and all the seagoing tugs, you steam around all night in concentric circles until the actual bomb. Now that was the scariest thing I ever saw in my life, because when that Baker exploded and that big mushroom of water and stuff went up in the air. It looked to me, facing it, like it was from here to that door. And I thought that big wall of water was gonna come right out and swamp us, and that's from 10 miles away. Well, at that time, it was quite an interesting deal because we didn't know there was anything down the road and stuff. We didn't know about the so-called radioactivity and that stuff, you know, that, that you could get from nuclear stuff. Uh, they talk about these badges and stuff that, they, that the people wore. I never saw one. I don't know what they looked like. Like I say, with Baker, it just scared the hell out of me. 
you know, with seeing that big wall of water, but then after it settled down and we steamed back in there, there was a, didn't think anything of it. I was a deckhand on board uh, the USS Renville APA-227 at Operation Hardtack 1. We were six miles from ground zero on surface tests, underwater tests, aerial tests, and what have you. There was one ship it was like a destroyer or destroyer escort, escort that was three of them in a row. One was one mile from the point of detonation. One, the next one was two miles, and the next one was three miles from the point of detonation, okay? Now, uh, when this did go off, we went through the procedure of our backs turned to it and hands over eyes, and there was no other protection. So then we uh, uh, noticed that the first ship that was one mile away went, just left the water. It left it. You could see, you could see the horizon underneath the fantail as it went up. And it went past vertical. And then it came down and that's all we've seen of it. The next one went on up, not quite vertical, that which was two miles away. And it dropped down and it kind of bobbed around a little bit to my recollection like that and it just went right on down. And the third one, after the blast was over with, this ship was the only one that was floating. The third one was supposed to be three miles away from the point of detonation. I was at this one uh, test that we had that uh, I was on the trainer seat for the five inch uh, cannon that we had on the fantail. And uh, I was up, turned away from it and, and with our back to the, to the detonation and uh, with our hands over our eyes as we were told it's the only protection we had. And uh, we were uh, uh, at the point of detonation well, uh, it was a matter of something like seven and a half seconds or something like that. It was all in that ballpark. And then it, it hit, and it hit awful hard. And it knocked me clear out of the trainer seat down onto the turret. And I rolled off of that down onto the deck and uh, skinned me up a little bit. But I'm bad go. I was a sailor. I jumped up and shook it off. I believe that it was the underwater test that broke the seam in the hull of the ship, and I didn't get to see that particular uh, detonation, but I did uh, uh, feel the consequences of it, in which uh, at the point of uh, detonation, well, it threw me over the two uh, after steering columns. It threw me clear over there. I lost my, I lost my uh, earphones, and I had no control of myself at all. And they said, someone said, well, let's, there it is right over there, just starting out with just a little bit of a mound. And if you look close enough, at the right place at the right time, you would see it. And then it started picking up, building up. The mound started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all at once, that mound would kind of leave the water. And then it would have a huge, big shaft come up from that, just pulling everything up from the bottom. And, it, and then it would go, go up and up and up and up and up. And, uh, but I have never seen anything so more beautiful in my life as so many of the different oranges, the yellows, the purples, the greens, the colors all in that whole, in that whole thing, it was there. And I don't know, I thought to myself afterwards, I said, I wonder if Michelangelo could paint such a picture. But it was the most deadly thing that, that I or anybody else on board that ship had ever witnessed in their lives.
I was a crew member on an RB-36. It was a reconnaissance bomber version of the B-36. Instead of having four bomb bays, it had two. And the forward bomb bay was converted to a photo department. We were airborne for, well, the entire trip, about 30 hours. And uh, we started very early in the previous evening or so. And we went eastward as far as Texas. And we're measuring winds aloft from Texas all the way into Nevada. And then we rendezvoused um, probably western New Mexico or Western Arizona, New Mexico in that corner somewhere, and then ran on the uh, the, the site for the drop in uh, New er, Nevada. You'd line up on a on a bomber run, um, just like you're running on a target. You'd have a series of checkpoints and you and uh, they would take measurements as far as drift and things like that to make sure you put the bomb where it was supposed to be. Uh, the 10 B-36s were deployed uh, two groups of five in what we referred to as a bomber stream, fire airplanes in a row on each side, 500 foot up above each other and I was in the left rear position at 43,500 feet. And the B-50 came up from Walker or Kirtland or one of the bases in the southwest there, and he had the atom bomb on board. We made a dummy run and came around, all 11 of us, and then back and made a final run. Then he, was, he dropped the bomb at, on that run. We were all, at least in the command, part of the intercom system on the airplane could listen to other aircraft, and, uh, and the, including the guy on the B-50 dropping the bomb. And he identified himself as the Playboy. That was his code name. And to tell us that he was going to run, where he's going to drop the bomb, he identified it as, I'm the Playboy, and I'm on the graveyard run. And this time, they were going to drop the bomb. And like it happened a couple minutes ago, I remember him saying, um, I'm the playboy on the graveyard run. Nine, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Son of a bitch! The bomb didn't go out of the airplane. I don't know, it got hung up mechanically or some damn thing. And, uh, of course, we all looked at one another. And, uh, you know, like, it's like somebody turned all the engines off. Like, you know, we were just in complete suspension. Like, what was going to happen? Well, he, he pulled it and it went manually, I guess like a salvo. Obviously, didn't go where it was supposed to go. Instead of blowing up like 1,000 or 1,200 feet, it blew up quite a few thousand feet above that. So we were a little closer to it than they had counted on. I got to the blister and I looked down and the bomb was cloudless in its initial formation. It looked like a giant orange basketball which kept getting bigger and bigger. Then the clouds started to go up from it. Bounced twice, of course. When the bomb blew up, we got the air wave, right, initially right from the blast. And then the second blast, when the um, reflection of the wave when it hit the ground and came back up again. Bounced the airplane a second time. It's the last airplane in the run and a reconnaissance model with the cameras and all the other gear on board. We were told that the cloud would be about 40,000, 29 as we went by and 40 something coming back. After we made the big U-turn and headed back for it, the cloud obviously was over 60,000 feet then and going up. Um, my aircraft commander made a decision for which I'm eternally grateful. I'm not going through that cloud. So we made a big sweeping flight around it, but not through it. After we got back to Fairchild and they hosed all the airplanes down and a couple it took us away and checked us all over and took the pocket dosimeters and all the bang meter and all that crap out of the airplane. 
they hose all the airplanes down on another part of the field. But then we read in the paper how successful the, the test was. <laughs> I've always felt the myself. So it wasn't quite that successful. Camp Desert Rock, when we first got there, was just a spot in the sand. And we went to the, I remember we went to the far end of the road, and that's where we set up our tents and everything in our motor pool. And as other outfits came in, they filled in from where we were at up towards Mercury Junction, different companies. And it was just, uh, just rows of tents. And that was it. It was strictly all just army troops. There wasn't a lot to do out there. Our outfit was pretty lucky. We got to go on road patrol when your name came up, and we patrolled the highways from Desert Rock to the railhead at Las Vegas with our wreckers and our little trucks and toolboxes and everything, and any military stragglers along the road or breakdowns why we'd stop fix them if we couldn't while well, we would tow them in. First shot that I remember we were just on an open hillside facing ground zero and just before the shot was dropped from an airplane they told us to turn around and put your hands behind your head put your knees up you know and put your head between your knees and that we did and you could you could just feel like a blowtorch coming across the back of your neck when the blast went off and then you could feel the pressure hit you. I remember one guy that was in our outfit, he got excited or something and he jumped up just before the blast hit and it just knocked him flat. After the heat wave went by and, the, and then the blast and the noise and everything, then we could turn around. They said we could turn around and I remember seeing the mushroom cloud then. This huge big mushroom cloud that was beautiful really, all colors was boiling from the outside, you know, up and around and back in the bottom and going up and up and up in a big ice cap formed clear over the top of it. You would set an aircraft at a tank or something so many yards from ground zero or so many degrees, you know, it was all pretty well documented. Then afterwards, why they would go back and take what measurements they could. It, but most of the time, it was too hot to get back in there. One airplane was turned while well, it was facing the blast. And afterwards, it was set in the right angle. It had been turned around halfway, a big bomber. And I think one of the most unusual sights that we saw was a, a tank. I think it was Uncle shot. And it was, when we went out to look at it, the, the turret had been fused right to the bottom of the tank from the blast and the heat. It was just like one piece of metal instead of a turning turret. Come back one time, I had two captains with me and in a jeep, we went up to look at a tank and a command car and the Geiger counter went off to scale and I told them we had to leave and they didn't want to. They wanted to go farther and I wouldn't go. And anyway, I got burnt out when I came back out through decon station. I was burnt out and they took my Geiger counter, my film badge and my dosimeter away from me for three days. They wouldn't let me go back in because I was burnt out. I like to put it like this. Uh, 
the blockbusters in World War II dropping on London. If a, if a blockbuster dropped and you were still could get up and walk away, then you had nothing to worry about. But with the, with the atomic bomb, the nuclear bomb and that, uh, you might be able to walk away, but uh, it'll probably get you down the road. Once we were had ionizing radiation in our bodies, we were contaminated for life. And you can take that to the bank. We were contaminated for life. My children, three of my children were born after the tests. And then we talk. One later on in years, it was her teenage years, she had a hole in her heart. The next one come up behind her. She had bad valves in her heart. And the last one is borderline retardation. I often think about it in our motor pool. You know, all of those vehicles had been out there on these tests and we'd come back in and we'd have to repair them and crawl around under them and all of that sand would just like powder under them. And I, I wonder about some of those guys afterwards. And the thing that really bothered me was that when I had my children, my children seemed like they picked up what I had. I had a couple of crippled children. One of them's dead. Uh, one of them, he's on Social Security. He's crippled, and it just, uh, my daughter, uh, she broke out with these rashes around her throat and on her back and the little knots like I got. And it's, and, Loss of teeth was another thing. The gums bleeding a lot. I've had a lot of dental problems. I'm very proud to have been a sailor. I have been proud to serve my country in any way. But I don't understand why they would subject us to such long-term devastation, physically, mentally, and for what I've done and what it's done to my mind, in my mind, from those tests, what I have done to my children. You know, I've to talked about a, a little bit to different people, and they kind of, you know, kind of shrug it off, think you're making up a, a story. Our government wouldn't do that. That, you know, that's what a lot of them, the attitude that they, they give to you, that, they just wouldn't do that. Human testing will always be part of the development of weapons and weapons delivery systems. And the years have proven that it can be safe. The human testing of nuclear effects, however, stands as an aberration, a grotesque miscue. Troops, pilots, naval personnel, and countless others found that they were nuclear guinea pigs standing at ground zero trying to believe that somehow this was all right. Sandy wastes at Yucca Flat, Nevada, a new series of atomic explosions are set off. Tanks are among the obsolete pieces of army equipment being tested in the exercises called Operation Teapot. 
More than 9,000 servicemen have been assembled at the Proving Grounds, ready to take their places in forward trenches. In a grim new age of warfare, today's fighting men must be taught survival on an atomic battlefield. While the troops take cover, the Army's giant new 100-inch camera is pointed toward the blast tower. Men tensely eye the control booth as the seconds tick off. Familiar mushroom cloud snakes skyward, hurling the atom's deadly radiation high into the heavens. The sound and shock waves roll over the men huddled in the trenches. Never before have we had such a close-up view. Lighting up the desert skies for miles around, the fierce fireball flare is the signal for instant action. Quickly, the men are ordered to leave their positions. The explosion's radioactive fallout is almost as dangerous as the blast itself. In the vitally important precaution of dusting each other off, the lowly broom becomes an item of military significance. Next, Geiger counters are used to check the troops for signs of radioactivity. Marching out of the shadow of the atom's awesome might come fighting men, symbolizing America's determination to keep strong in a restless world. Within the last two years, more than 20 of these awesome blasts have echoed across the desolate Nevada desert. Interwoven throughout the story of the tests at Yucca Flats is a second story, the role played by the United States Air Force. Two Air Force sniffer planes fall the assignment of invading the atomic cloud to gather specimens of radioactive particles for analysis by nuclear scientists. The sniffers carry filter traps mounted on the wings and fuselage during their cloud sampling missions. Their crews do a job considered impossible a few years ago. Today, advanced techniques permit the men to stay inside the radioactive cloud for a time without harm. Other Air Force experiments probe the effects of the blinding atomic light on the eyes of aircraft crewmen. Many types of goggles and protective lenses are tested. The volunteers will look directly at the fierce fireball flare of the atomic burst. Quickly, the men turn to instruments which record the effects of the searing flash. The tests go on. Aircraft, some obsolete, some new, are staked out at various angles from the blast, for we must learn how to protect our fighters and bombers. Special cameras in slow motion record each fraction of a second as the aircraft disintegrate under the shattering impact of this powerful force for destruction. From these films, the Air Force adds new pages to its knowledge and mastery of atomic warfare. Now, at a closely guarded airstrip, the most dangerous mission of all is about to begin. A B-50 waits to be loaded. For security reasons, the screen must be partially blacked out as an atom bomb is raised into position under the eyes of the supervising engineer. In the plane, codenamed Rosebud, three men share a heavy responsibility. The pilot, the radar navigator, and the bombardier. The target is that X six miles below. You're about to see the closest shot of an atom bomb blast yet released for public view. This is the story of America's ever-expanding atomic weapons program. This, within security limits, is the role played by the Air Force. Now for 
for civil defense, another realistic test is held. In a two-story house on Main and Elm Streets, a mannequin family waits, 3,500 feet from atomic destruction. They're lifeless dummies, but to the civil defense officials testing bomb shelters, they could help save lives. A second home stands a mile away. America is seeking through these drills to strengthen home front defenses, for their strength means our safety. Dozens of cars are on the streets of the ghost hamlet in Nevada. And marching to within two miles of the blast center, 1,500 GIs take cover in slit trenches, closer to an atomic explosion than any human being since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. blinding flash silhouettes observers seven miles away then its ugly mushroom cloud swirls skyward within an hour the dirt cake troops all safe have abandoned their foxholes and are pushing through a veil of dust as gi's pointing geiger counters lead the way the closest house is leveled by the blast equal to 15,000 tons of tnt but small as a bombs go the second building, 7,500 feet from the explosion, still stands. Although protected by every device known to atomic scientists, troops are unable to penetrate to the blast center for many hours because of the deadly radioactive contamination shrouding the area. Val Peterson, civil defense director, warns us to prepare, for this could be your house and your window. Here again, the atomic blast. 3,500 feet away, a split second later. Past one of the cars exposed to the atomic fury, a civil defense official finally is able to reach the rubble of the two-story house we just saw topple. Almost unbelievably, mannequins in the basement bomb shelter are found to be unharmed. The second house seems to have suffered comparatively minor damage. Windows have been blown in. All Americans must work together. For the stronger our home front defenses, the less the chance an atomic attack will come. Troops in Nevada prepare for an underground lake explosion, the first ever photograph. As powerful as a thousand tons of TNT, this weapon reportedly can be carried by one man. Radioactive debris flies skyward from another underground explosion as a new weapon, the atomic satchel, joins America's arsenal. Rival Town Atom Test measured a model village in the Nevada desert against the awesome power of nuclear energy. Buildings of various materials went up. A million dollars worth of equipment was installed, including lifelike mannequins and tons of food to measure the contamination caused by radiation. The big dolls were survival town's sole inhabitants. Tanks took part in their first atomic maneuvers, some less than a mile away, the closest yet in any test. Nearly 6,000 persons participated, including troops sheltered by trenches. Many cameras in many locations film the single blast.
wreckage in the desert held vital information on how to survive an enemy attack. With Geiger counters to check the radiation, experts assessed the damage. An aluminum building was left a gaping wreck. Concrete or cinder block houses weathered the blast best. This one was less than a mile away. Survival Town's electric wires have become a twisted, tangled mass. Demonstrating the importance of civil defense preparedness, the elaborate exercises proved survival is possible, offering new hope to all who live in the shadow of the atomic age. Navy ship steamed in late 1952 toward Enuitak Atoll on a momentous mission. The world's first hydrogen bomb housed in this barn-like building was to be exploded on a tiny target island named Elugiland. Strange, secret testing devices had been set up to measure mankind's most fearsome weapon. While the task force cruised 50 miles from the doomed island, the seconds closer and closer to the first hydrogen blast on Earth. Minus 15 seconds. the shockwave as it rolls toward the flagship. The thick stand boiling cloud surges to a height of 40,000 feet two minutes after zero. Ten minutes later it is snaked skyward ten miles. Observers fly toward the target center. The islands surrounding Aluja Lab have been swept almost clean by the fireball flare, which enveloped an area three miles wide in the twinkling of an eye. Aluja Lab is gone, nothing there but a deep crater and water. From an island that once was, but is no more, out of an ugly mushroom cloud, mankind enters the hydrogen age, an era of danger, of challenge, of opportunity.